This is video 20 in our series, Topics in Tensor Analysis. Uh, a reminder, the playlist for all the videos is featured on the website, digital-university.org. Okay, in this video, once again, we are going to determine the Christoffel symbols for cylindrical coordinates. Only this time, we're going to use the metric tensor or the relationship between Christoffel symbols and metric tensors. Um, remember from the last video, the setup for cylindrical coordinates, we have psi, rho, and z, where the position vector r can be expressed like this. And then in the previous videos, we had labeled our curvilinear axis uh, as u with the superscript numeral. So rho will be u1, psi u2, and z u3. And I believe it was in uh, video number 13 where we had determined the metric tensor for cylindrical coordinates. And this was the matrix that we obtained. Now, Remember, for the metric tensor, or at least the covariate metric tensor, that's obtained by taking the dot product of the tangential vectors to each of the coordinate axes. Now, with cylindrical coordinates, and also with spherical coordinates, these are orthogonal to each other. So you get zeros unless you're taking the dot product of a tangential vector with itself. And then we'll get non-zero elements or non-zero expressions on the diagonal elements. So in cylindrical coordinates, g11 is 1, g22 is rho squared, g33 is 1. Then in video number 15, we had discussed metric tensors with contravariant components. And what we had discovered there is that the matrix for covar or the covariant uh, metric tensor, its matrix is the inverse as what it is for the covariant metric tensor. So the covariant metric tensor, its expression is a matrix. The contravariant metric tensor, its expression is a matrix. There are non-singular matrices, and they are inverses of each other. Now, with cylindrical coordinates, here it's simple to find the inverse of this matrix. All we have to do is take the reciprocal of the diagonals. So for the contravariant metric tensor, G11 is 1, G33 is 1, and G22 will be 1 over rho squared. Now, obviously, for um, curvilinear systems, they generally are not orthogonal to each other. So if you're in three-dimensional space and you're finding the metric tensor, then we're going to have a 3 by 3 matrix where all of these are non-zero. And finding its inverse is a little more involved. If you go to um, um, the video or to go to the website, and then go to the playlist for linear algebra videos. I think it's in um, videos 10 and video 11, where we demonstrate the technique of um, finding inverse matrices when you have non-singular matrices. OK, um, let's take a look at our formula. Now, this is the general way in which Gustavo symbols are determined. If you have a certain curvilinear system, then you have to determine its covariant metric tensor and its contravariant metric tensor. And as we saw for cylindrical coordinates, that's pretty straightforward. Also, um, with the relationships that we have amongst the uh, different components of the metric tensors, it makes it even more simple, because if these numbers don't match, then it's automatically 0. Remember, 
we had non-zeros for G11, G22, and G33, which is 1, 1 over rho squared, and 1. So if these don't match, it's automatically 0. Same thing we're taking the partial derivatives. If these don't match, these are automatically 0. What's more, when they do match, we have G11, G22, and G33. Well, if you have G11 and G33, that's a 1 in the numerator, which means that we're going to be taking the partial derivative of 1, which of course is 0. So what this tells us is that for these expressions, the only time that we have a chance where it is not 0 is if this is 2, 2, in which case we are taking the partial of rho squared. Otherwise, we're taking the partial of 1, which of course is 0. So let's consider, we know then that this has to be 2, and this has to be 2. Now we're taking the partial of rho squared, that's what g22 is, but with respect to what? Here we have ui, uj, uk, where i or j or k can be 1, 2, or 3. Well, we know u1, that corresponds to rho, u2 corresponds to psi, and u3 corresponds to z. Well, if we take the partial rho squared with respect to psi, that's 0. If we take the partial rho squared with respect to z, that's 0. The only time we don't get 0 so I'm going to take it with respect to rho, and that's u1. So these have to be 1s. Otherwise, it's not going to make it, otherwise we're going to get 0 for our derivatives. So that really simplifies things for us. This has to be 1, 1, and 1. And these expressions have to be 2's. Well, let's see what happens when we are guaranteed that j and k are 2 and i is 1. What kind of Gustafel symbol does that give us? So over here, i is 1, j is 2, and this equals 1 half g, k is 2, therefore m has to be 2, or this is going to be 0, m is 2, so we have Gustafel symbol 1, 2, 2 equals and k is 2. This, that's the partial of, by design, g2, 2, two with respect to u1. Now here, k is 2, but i is 1. These differ, so that's 0. This is ij, which is 1, 2, they differ, that's automatically zero. So here's our expression for gamma 1, 2, 2, where this is 1 over rho squared. So this equals 1 over 2 times rho squared. And of course, this is the partial. of rho squared with respect to rho. Now the partial of rho squared with respect to rho is just 2 times rho, 
So let's write that in. Times two times rho equals, and that's just going to be one over rho. So there's our first Gustavo uh, symbol. Now let's consider the case where these two numbers are guaranteed to be 2, 2. So now i equals 2, k equals 2, j equals 1. So what kind of a Gustavo symbol does that give us? i is 2, j is 1, this equals 1 half g, k is 2, therefore m has to be 2, therefore this has to be 2. Now here we have j, k, but now j is 1, k is 2, so that's 0. Here we have i, j, those differ, so this is 0. So we have the partial of g, 2, 2, j is 1. Just like we did before, so this equals 1 over rho, which we could have predicted because we had shown in a previous video I think it was number 16 or 17 that if you have a Gustavo symbol, say this is the same, but we have ij, and this one has those reversed, we show shown that indeed those are equal to each other. And so we could have predicted that, yes, this has to be the same as this, and indeed it turns out to be the case. Now, let's consider the situation where these are guaranteed to be 2, 2. So now we have i is 2, j is 2, and k equals 1. So what kind of Gustavo symbol do we get from this? Let's erase this. We don't need it any longer. Now we have i is 2, j is 2, k equals 1, so we have 1 half g, k is 1, therefore m has to be 1, so this has a 1. Now here, We have j, k. Well, j is 2, but k is 1. They differ. That's 0. Here we have k, i. k is 1. i is 2. Those differ. That's 0. So this will equal minus g11, the partial of g22. With respect to u1, and we know from before, g11 is just one. So this equals minus one half. And once again, we have the partial of rho squared with respect to rho. And that equals 2 times rho, that partial derivative. So you have this times 2 rho equals minus rho. And there we are. We're finished. So we have determined three Gustavo symbols. We had gamma, 1, 2, 2 equals gamma 
two one two and that was one over rho then we had gamma two two one and that equaled minus rho so there they are and of course this is exactly what we obtained in the last video this time it was considerably less work because in previous videos we had determined what the metric tensors are and the metric tensors have pretty simple expressions which as you saw really simplified our workload here but anyway that's it for this video then um, in the next video I think we can start to approach on uh, the concept of covariant differentiation so come back and join us for that video and then we'll continue along here with our